Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2016, brought to you by Infor. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. We're back at the Javits Center in New York City, everybody. Mark Scabelli is here. He is the head of uh, Hook and Loop, uh, Infor's digital uh, company that now is, they're facing two customers, uh, the chief creative officer of Infor. Mark, welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. Great, thanks for having me back, David. Really so great. we talked two years ago at New Orleans, a year and a half ago, and we were, kind of got the Kool-Aid injection of, of Hook and Loop, <laughs> which is this amazing you know, design firm that essentially Charles brought in-house, aimed at all the software, you guys make beautiful software is kind of one of your taglines, mm -hmm. and now you've decided to point that externally. So give us the update sure. for the last you know, year and a half, two yeah. years, and then we'll talk about the new business. Yeah, thanks. So we, we, we systematically wanted to change Infor software, right? So we had to do that, and we talked, as you just mentioned, right? We, we wanted to make part of Infor's DNA, and I think we did that. I think we did a really good job of um, sort of franchising out the design thinking, the user first mentality, and getting it to infect all our products. And we've seen that as you look around today and go to the, you know, each station here at Inforum, um, the, 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 the products are totally different than they were when we last met. And they were, you know, they continue to improve every day. So Hook and Loop, basically core, is still working towards that, that initiative with Soho XI and the change we're making there. And then we realized the pivot, we had, we had gone through a transformation as a company. Infor had gone through a, a transformation. I mean, I think we're a different company than we were four years ago. Um, especially, so how do we? How do we? We were getting asked a lot from customers about how we did it, and can we can we pivot to that for them? Can we can we start working towards that with them? So it seemed like a good time. Um, Charles uh, and Duncan, uh, our president, wanted us to, to sort of say, okay, now let's take that same viewpoint and bring it out to our customers. Take that team transformation. Take that same transformational model and give it to our customers. So we've done that. We've pivoted with H and L Digital now. I'm running a team similar to how we started with Hook and Loop just focus on customer engagement. It's pretty rare to see that in the business. I mean, I, the only example I can even remotely think of is Pivotal Labs, mm -hmm. you know, but they're, you know, they're really, not, they're, they're certainly not an applications company. Mm -hmm. So it's, not, you know, it's a big delta between what yeah. they sell and what the you know, design guys do. Yeah. I mean, you're really married yeah. to the, the software and the user experience. Can you discuss the challenges of taking a legacy software platform and bringing in a whole new UX, because when you do that, yeah. you're envisioning new function. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. And then the, the development team goes, well, it doesn't do that today. And so, how do you square that circle over the last <laughs> you know, couple of years? Yeah. Um, you know, what we realized was we had to get in deep with our product teams. We had to be part of their roadmaps, we had to be part of their, uh, of their, um, of their planning of what they were going to release and when they were going to release it. Christina Van Houten, who heads up our, our, our product development teams, you know, they, she's been instrumental in getting Hook and Loop embedded inside those teams. What we do is we also broke out into pods and said, you know, we're going to look at industry uh, and then look at what products affect those industries and we're going to have Hook and Loop UX experts then work alongside those product teams. And we're going to make sure that our changes, our business processes are put inside those, um, inside those roadmaps. I think that's where this pivot really plays a big role. It's really hard to be inside a product roadmap. It's, it takes a longer journey, right? It's taken us a, a longer time. When we move to more of a, a publish and subscribe model where the products are actually able to publish information and we can subscribe to it as h and Digital, we can create all new experiences, all new business processes for our customers in a really deep, integrated way that um, while Pivotal Labs is amazing, they can't do. Um, they just don't have that, that, that knowledge or bandwidth or, or, or um, deep expertise in enterprise software. So we've actually built out a, what we call a connective tissue team that actually connects our products together. So we go from product roadmaps to publishing from those products to now building new experiences with a whole new team. And when you're in that product roadmap phase, it sounds like the, the design folks are a fundamental part of that connective tissue and maybe, yeah. maybe sharing DNA and vice versa, becoming more product oriented. So it's a joint sort of yeah, let's do it this way type of decision. Not a, hey, here's what I would recommend as the UX expert, is that right? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great point. Um, that, that deep embedding with the product was important because otherwise you do kind of get that hands off kind of mm -hmm. view from product teams who want it to, you know, have just been doing it that way and want it to be that way or, you know, they've been talking to customers and they hear something different. So instead of, you know, he said, she said, we just kind of embedded them all together and like I said, Christina's done a great job of, of making sure our, our, what we were calling kind of product managers, but they really weren't, they're more like producers uh, on the hook and loop side, we're, we're making sure that the, 
the ethos, the, um, the, the Inforce strategy of experience was being um, really uh, artfully put into all our products and making sure that was happening as a partnership, that it wasn't, you know, we were going to customer sites together, we were you know, exploring changes to the business process together, so there's a, there's a joint there's a joint marriage there. And, and then last question that George wants to jump in. It, it, does that create friction <laughs> relative to you know, this notion of agile and you know, DevOps and you know, you know, sprints? Uh, does it slow things down and is that okay or does it not slow things down? I don't think it slows things down but it, it can cause friction to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have, I mean anybody coming in and do something differently, transformation. I think it's another great lesson for us though, right? We learned what it was like to be a transformational group inside an organization. I mean, quite frankly, we, we, we have been and we continue to be. So when we go in and we talk to our customers, and some of them are, they're part of transformational groups, right? They're trying to digitally transform their company. They're looking around going, I, how do I change hearts and minds? How do I convince these people? What did you guys do? How did you get there? How can you help us? So a lot of our job, uh, as I mentioned on main stage yesterday, is around um, you know, in, in affecting hearts and minds and getting people to, to, to embrace that and be excited about it. Mm. That, that could be part of our, the hardest part of our job sometimes. Right, right. So, I um, want to bounce two scenarios off you and see where you fit relative. Um, at Apple, the industrial design and UI design, they're a, they're a group freestanding and they're assigned to be parts of individual teams. And in fact, they have um, pretty much veto power. Um, that's how it was, Jobs set it up. Then in Facebook, their analytics group has uh, individuals that are assigned to the product groups, and they don't have veto power, but they their performance is considered um, not complete until they make until they affect a change. How do how are you set up relative to that? Yeah. So Hook and Loop Core uh, was originally set up as a, having that veto power, right? That that we be at a certain stage in a roadmap, and to be XI compliant, you had to achieve um, a certain certain parameters around usability. So we'd have a, in Hook and Loop we had a team that would actually go uh, and look at the products and, and do the product testing and do everything else and validate that they were XI compliant. So we had veto power at that point. That doesn't always work, right? Because you, you need to ship products. So, so where, do you start, um, where do you start prioritizing what's a UX you know, uh, company-wide strategy change that's needed? And something that's really the customer wants. It's, a, it's an enhancement that has to happen. So, um, Doing it in a veto way doesn't work. What you have to do is you have to, you can't just be the end part of the process. You can't say, well, we gave you all the tools, go do it, and then we're going to come look at it at the end and see if you did it right. We're going right. to check your work. You can't. You got to be deeply embedded in that team and be validating and checking it all along this process so to make sure that it's actually, it's actually happening. And, and you're helping them do it on, in their timeline, on their space, and you're not coming at the ninth hour saying, we know you're about to ship that, but it's totally wrong in the UX and you can't, you can't ship it. That's just, a, that would be just, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. Okay. So hook and loop digital. Um, the world is changing. We all talk about digital transformations. We see these nonlinear consumption patterns occurring in the customer base. Mark Benioff said it. He said there are going to be more SaaS companies that come out of non-technology companies than technology companies. So everybody wants to be a software company. So the timing's great, but take us through the, the strategy and where you're at. Yeah. We, I, you said it just right there, right? These non-technology companies becoming software companies. So excited about that. That's the stuff that gets me the most excited about what we're doing at H&L Digital. Looking at these customers that are in commoditized markets, that are struggling to, 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 um, to figure out ways to differentiate themselves, right? To figure out how digitization can move them from just being an automated system and having automation and a vertical business process be enhanced on the bottom line. How do you actually affect the top line through digitization? How do you change the way customers interact with your business, the way your employees do the operations, and do that in a very big holistic way? And then um, if you're not a software company, what does that really mean to my customers? What data am I providing them? How am I providing it? Who's running it? Um, you know, I'm really, I'm a CIO, I'm really worried about my IT infrastructure, I'm worried about email staying up, I'm worried about, you know, uh, uh, runtime, everything else. I don't really have time to have I, to think of IP. I don't have time to strategize it. I don't have time to run into the cloud. Certainly support it. So, what can what can Infor do to help do that? Well, we start with our product set. We look at it. We assemble what products we need. We talked about building out that connected tissue team to to make sure that. Uh, if products aren't publishing so that we could subscribe to it, that they will, that they aren't in their roadmap. We'll build workarounds um, and, uh, to, to accommodate that. We'll layer on top of that data science, our new IoT platform that was announced yesterday. Um, and we'll work to figure out what can we do to drive the data that the, the customer already owns to their end customer to keep them inside that ecosystem and drive value. So you can imagine if you're an um, animal feed company out you know, somewhere and you're, you're 
your only differentiation is that maybe you make really healthy feed or like that it's just good for the animals. And I got a website. Yeah, and I got a website <laughs> and I hope that my farmers believe in it and my brand's strong. Um, how can you start to differentiate? How can you move to being about animal health? And you do that through branding, but you, you got to do it through technology now. You have to provide technology that drives animal health, right? So you can connect to IoT products that exist in the, in, on the farm. You can connect the cows so that they, on, you, know, you know when things need to be timed so that when they're, they're fed the right feed that you're getting higher yields and performance. And all that is, is data I can, I can give back to the farmer. And as a feed company, I get to keep you in my ecosystem. You want to use my feed company because it's all connected for you. Your milking machine data that's coming from another vendor is, still, is connected to here and it's connected to how much feed's going to get ordered. And that's a really deep ecosystem. And uh, you know, like I said yesterday, if you've ever downloaded a song from iTunes, you, you know how hard it is to get out of the <laughs> ecosystem. Which yeah, yeah, well, but this is a big shift for people. This is going to drive a lot of CFOs crazy because that, the CFO of that company says, oh no, I got to, where am I going to get these resources? How am I going to pay for this? It's way more expensive than a website, but, okay, but, I, but if I don't do this, I'm toast. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a, it's a painful shift for yeah. a lot of organizations. What advice are you giving, and how are you, you know, talking them down from the tree? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I think you know it's the same way they were looking at ERP, uh, you know, for a long time. They're you know they're writing big mm. checks for ERP, um, and they're writing based on product on, on product choices. We want to make those choices based on solutions. That's not a new idea in selling, right? M moving from selling a product to selling a solution. So we we wanted to move much. F faster to that solution selling kind of model. And to do that, you've got to create these, these ecosystem models that, un that you fundamentally understand that in for product support. So once you have that, I think it's kind of a no-brainer to, if you're going to pay for ERP anyway, you might as well be paying for so something that can bundle into a solution that I can give to my end customer and keep them inside my ecosystem. Like that just seems like a, no a no-brainer. Nice logical progression. Yeah, logical yeah. progression, yeah. Right. And now we're talking to CIOs where before, it might have been more on the CMO's uh, side, but by, by having the CEO back at the table, I think that also changes the conversation mm -hmm. for the CFO. Mark, it sounds like what you're talking about is actually further along the last mile as far, the, as, far as far as the customer's thinking in terms of transformational impact relative to the Infor software itself, which is industry specific. But you're talking about you know, turning a, a fertilizer business into a you know, agricultural sort of services business. Um, one is the Salesforce up to you know, pushing your level of transformation and, and um, is the rest of the organization um, up to connecting their software to your vision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Soma, our, our head of development, has been um, just hammering the product teams for the last three years, to be honest, to um, make sure they're publishing to our business vault. Um, that's why I released Sky Vault, I think, two years ago. Um, that that, that publish and subscribe model was important to us. We kind of knew that we needed an API structure for our, for our organization. And that API structure is what allowed us to be able to do this. If we didn't have that, if we didn't have the ability to subscribe to our, our products that we're publishing, we couldn't build here. Can you give us some examples of those APIs that you know, maybe in, in earlier eras were screens you know, on, on an ERP system? What, what would be? Um, I think you see it in GT Nexus, right? You see it when um, you, we've, we've, you know, re we've not only recreated the UX of GT Nexus, but then you have these in-context apps. These in-context or modules that sit alongside GT Nexus uh, is all about supply chain. So not only am I now able to see, when you talk about supply chain, I'm not just able to see GT Nexus data, but I'm subscribing to other um, products that are in the Infor product set, and they appear on the side of my screen, and those are basically, we're basically subscribing to those um, from an API structure. Okay. So if it's, if it's um, my orders and my date to ship, that might not be out of the same system that my GT Nexus is in, but they're overlaid because I've been, I'm able to pull the API, I can overlay it on top of my GT Nexus data very quickly. Okay, very, uh, that's very interesting. How has your, <laughs> I'm interested in the evolution of Mark Sabelli from the standpoint of ad agency person to digital strategist. Um, because I, I feel like a lot of the ad agency models are not going to translate into the new world. Many will, uh, but you're making that transition very successfully. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was at ad agencies for a long time and then uh, I was always in digital uh, in some way or another. I started at um, the company that founded Priceline in before you know the 90s late 90s and it was always a digital bent to what we were doing in, in advertising and then a few years ago um, we we 
I think the industry kind of shifted to a storytelling model in digital. Um, that was you know, the, the advent of social and mobile helped us do that. And I think we're seeing the same thing, we could do the same thing in enterprise software. It's a storytelling narrative model, just how do you deliver it through technology, not just marketing. It's that we don't want to just deliver it through an ad or a message that we have that plays on YouTube. We want to deliver it through the actual technology that's delivered to their customer, to their employee, and then their partners that are in the operations. So I mean, I think, I think it's, just, it's just a storytelling model um, shift. For me, it, it's kind of a no-brainer from how I told stories for a Vodka brand to a financial technology brand to something else. It's just, it's just a natural shift in, shift in storytelling. It's just a different channel. Well, but there is a technology and a platform component. Mm, sure. Which is, maybe it's not brand new, but it's certainly more robust than, than you know, 10 years ago and the whole API economy yeah. you know, changes that. And, that's, that's, and that's, that's easy to get wrong. And you, you talked about before, companies have to service and support this stuff, and there's a new support model that has to take place. So there are some organizational changes and cultural shifts, and, right. and it's a real challenge for, for people. But you guys are, I think, unique, as I ob observed before, at least in my view, relative to other software companies. Yeah, I certainly think our size helps us be, to, to, to um, activate around all of those things. We've, we've um, created a division inside our consulting group that's servicing, um, supporting, and maintaining uh, these cloud suites that we're putting up, these cloud solutions that we're putting up for the digital engagements. Um, so the customers don't need to worry about that. We've, we've built our structure on an API publish and subscribe model to help us build it. Um, I don't think any of this would be possible 10 years ago, six yeah, years right. ago. I think we just would have sold, you have a product problem, you know, a, a, a business process problem, here's a product that solves it. Instead, let's, let's bundle those things together and let's affect the top line of an organization. I mean, some of the big SIs, maybe, maybe IBM, but I mean, IBM is a huge company, right? And they're the services organization. They're, they're making some plays in, in digital, but for a $3 billion software company to be leading that charge, I think it's, um, I think you're in the lead in that regard. And not many companies are thinking the way you are, so congratulations on that vision. I'll give you the last word, thoughts on, on Inform Oh no, Inform has been great. It's, uh, it's great to be in New York. I mean, this yeah, is, like yeah, I said, yeah, on stage yeah. is my hometown, right? So Backyard, yeah. I, I would like to, to, to be able to, to own the New York venue for uh, Inform uh, going forward would be great. So I hope, uh, hope to see you guys here next year and next Inform and uh, be sitting right here in, in Javits Center. Excellent, all right, thanks again, Mark, appreciate it. Okay, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. Right after this, this is theCUBE. We're live from New York City. As colleges and universities